All right, book of Micah. All right, real quick, multiple. Um, let, let me do a little quiz. You know, we've been through a lot of these uh, major and minor prophets. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you some multiple uh, questions and see if you can get the right answer. Okay, so the people of Israel in the book of Micah, are they obeying God or rebelling from God? Rebelling, rebelling from God. Um, does God say in response to that, if they don't repent, does he say he's going to be proud of them or judge them? Judge and Johnny, that's from the concert the other night, the girl that said that God's super proud of all of us. He's going to judge them. But is God going to leave them without any future hope or is he going to leave them with hope? hope. With hope. All right. Well, we can go home. You guys have got it. Now, there's, y'all have seen the pattern though. You've seen this pattern over and over and over. And so it might, you might think, well, why do we need another minor prophet? You know, that's not Jonah. Why do we need that? Well, I think the main reason is this, and that's the point of this story, is that all of this scripture is testifying of Jesus. And so all of these prophets have a different angle and a different perspective that they are giving us of who Jesus would be and what Jesus would do. So uh, if y'all can go and turn, um, turn to Micah chapter 1. Um, we're going to spend most all of our time in Micah. I'll reference a few verses outside of Micah um, and may get y'all to read a few verses outside of Micah, but pretty much the whole thing's going to be in Micah tonight. Um, all right, so Micah prophesied in the southern kingdom of Judah. So you had the southern kingdom and the Northern Kingdom, right. From around 750-ish to around 690-ish was kind of the time frame he was, uh, he was alive and, and doing his thing. Um, do y'all remember what huge event happened in the Northern Kingdom during that time frame? Hmm? They... The northern kingdom, F-E-L-L, fell. -L -L, fell. <laughs> I'll spell it out for you. The northern kingdom fell in 722-ish, okay? Um, so that happened when he, uh, during his time as prophet. Um, his contemporaries, and, and when we say the word contemporary, do you know what we mean? When I say like his contemporary was Isaiah, contemporary, me, Aiden knows what it means. Kind yeah. Of similar person. Well, similar person, but it, it actually means like of the same time. Uh, contemporary can either mean modern or of the same time. Like we say contemporary Christian music, and that means modern Christian music. It can also mean of the same time period. And so uh, Micah was a prophet of the same time period as Isaiah and Hosea. So he gives us a different perspective. Isaiah was in the northern kingdom, and Isaiah rubbed shoulders with, with kings and princes, and, and all of that was around nobility a lot, where Micah was, we don't know a ton about him, but from where he's from and from what we gather from Scripture, he was kind of a nobody in a sense. He was from the country, and it's just a kind of a, a more plain countryman. So it, it gives us a, uh, a different perspective. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and dig in in verse 1. Can somebody read verse 1 for me? Who's got that? Who's got verse 1 of Micah? Josiah. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of... More Sheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Okay. 
right off the bat, right out of the gate. Where is Christ in that first verse? Can anybody tell me? You're, you stopped a little bit short. The word of the Lord. Two more words. That came. That came. The word of the Lord that came. Who is that? Ultimately. Jesus. Jesus was the word made flesh. Jesus is the true and greater Micah. He's the true and greater prophet. See, the prophets... The word, like it says here, the word of the Lord would come to them and they would proclaim it. Where Jesus was the word made flesh. So he was the word of the Lord that came. So right off the bat, um, we see Jesus right there in the first verse. All right, could someone read um, verses 2 through 5? Thank you, Aiden. Thank you. There's some terrifying language in there about God Almighty and Him coming down in judgment and wrath. We're going to start um, at verse 5 and kind of work our way back to verse 2. We're going to start with that last verse that says, What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So some geography helps us here and some history helps us here and informs us of what he's, what kind of wordplay he's doing here. And so Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom. And he says, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So, the northern kingdom fell long before the southern kingdom. And largely for the same sins, they both basically fell for the same reason, which was, um, it mentions high places in, in this passage. What, what does high places mean in the Old Testament when you see that term, typically? What did they do on the high places? Worship. Worship, uh, I, yes, idolatry. They worship false gods. And so he says, <clears throat> um, so he's kind of making this, this comparison here. And he's saying, um, Jerusalem's sins are the same as Samaria's sins. Okay? And they're, they're both worshiping false gods. That's the main sin. And, and I think it's important to understand that that's the root of their sin really. All these other sins that he talks about in the book are because they are following a false God. And they don't have a heart made new by the true and only real God. And so that all, it, it's, a, it's an outworking of who they're worshiping and the condition of their soul and their heart. Um, so he says this, he says, the Lord is coming out of His place. So, th this imagery here, He's like, yeah, you've got your high places for your false gods. The real God Almighty is coming out of His place. Out of His holy temple, where He is high and lifted up in glory and power. He is coming out of His place to tread upon the high places of the earth. And then verse 2, 
um, we kind of get this, um, he kind of sets the stage for how he's going to set up the rest of the book. And he says, let the Lord God be a witness against you. When you think of a witness, what do you think about? What setting do you think about? Court? Somebody say court? Yes. You think of a courtroom setting. And that, Micah uses courtroom language throughout uh, this book. And rightfully so. Um, Drew taught um, weeks ago in the book of Lamentations, and he talked about how God had made a covenant with his people, and he had given them a law. And he had said, if you obey this law, blessings will happen. If you disobey this law, all these curses will happen. Okay, and so it's like, a, a law has been given. If you break a law, where do you end up? In jail, but eventually in court, right? Where they're going to define, where they're going to decide on the penalty for the laws that you have broken. And so <clears throat> it's the same here. God has given them a law. They have disobeyed it. And he has come to bear witness against them. Um, and in verse 6, if, if somebody could read verse 6 for me real quick. Emma wants to read it. I think. Therefore, I will make a Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All right. He is going to take Samaria and make it a heap of ruins. So this is another play on words. Samaria, the name Samaria means the watch mountain, a mighty watch mountain. And he says, I'm going to take that watch mountain and I'm going to reduce it to a pile of rubble. And he had just said in the verse before, you remember he said, Samaria and Jerusalem are committing the same sins. And so he gave them this visual, this warning when Samaria was demolished, when he came and did that, when the um, Assyrians came in and, and leveled the place. He said, that's what's going to happen to you. And so he gave them a stern but gracious warning in that. And Micah uses this, that, this kind of play on words all the time throughout the book. Um, I didn't really realize until I started studying it how much. And I was talking to my mom about it. My mom um, <clears throat> reads and, and speaks Hebrew. And so she was like, yeah, that's basically the Hebrew language is word pictures just over and over and over um, and we'll see even Micah uses his own name later and, and works it in as kind of a word picture. All right, so chapter 2, if we can turn to chapter 2, uh, God's witness against them is going to continue. Verses 1 through 5. Um, can somebody read verses 1 through 5 of Micah chapter 2? Go for it, Lydia. Woe to those who deceive wicked, who devise wickedness and work the will on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them, the ha and houses, and they take them away. They oppress man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am, I am dis devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk ha haughtily, for this will be the time of disaster. And that day they shall... Take a taunt, take up a taunt song against you, and moan bitterly, and say, "We are utterly ruined. The changes the portion of my he changes the portion of my people. How he removes it from me. To the apostles he allots our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord." All right. So early on in there, it said there's a lot of bad stuff that they did in there. A lot of bad stuff. We're just going to hit on a few things. One, it said that they, they were coveting, and that was breaking the, the Tenth Commandment. Exodus twenty seventeen. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor your neighbor's wife, nor your, his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. They were not only coveting them, but they were taking them by violence, it says. It says they devise evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it, and listen to this, because it is in their power to do so. So these evidently were people who were in positions 
of enough power and authority that they could use their power and authority to abuse and take from other people. But in verse 3, God is both the witness and now he switches into judge mode. So he's all the things. He's judge, jury, executioner um, in his almighty courtroom. And, um, and he says, you have devised evil against these people because it is in your power to do so. You think you're all powerful. Not so. God is really the one with all the power. And he says, I'm now devising disaster against you. All right, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Who can read that for me? Aiden, go for it. And I said, Here I pray you, O heavens of Jacob, and you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, to hate the good and love the evil, to pluck off their skin from off them, and their flesh from off their bones? All right, so he continues his indictment against them. He says, Is it not for you to know justice? I think your version said judgment. Um, but most other versions say justice. Is it not for you to know justice? Um, again, why, how, how would the people of Israel have a leg up on anybody else in the world at that time on knowing what was just and what wasn't? The law. The law. God had given them the law. And there were detailed things in there about justice, about, um, you know, in particular, again, uh, for people that were helpless and needy and things like that. Um, and unfortunately, Israel still in the time of Christ was not doing this. Pastor Brad talked months ago about the, you remember the story of the, the widow's might when Jesus and his disciples were hanging around the temple and they were putting, the people were going by and putting their money in the, in the offering plate, so to speak. And um, the widow came and she put two mites in. And Jesus said, this woman has given more than all the others. They gave out of their excess. She gave all that she had. And there can be a lesson in there of sacrificial giving, and we all need to give sacrificially. But a lot of the point there was that this widow should not have been in that situation. She should have been taken care of and provided for because there is provision made in the law for that, but they weren't, they were circumventing it, they were looking for loopholes, like it says in, um, in this passage, they are um, perverting justice, and they continued to do that, and they were doing it here. Um, so then, there's a, a big um, change of gears in chapter 4, so one of the things I ask you, would God leave them without hope? No. In all of these prophets, prophets he, he always gives them hope for the future. And chapter 4 is an incredible passage on that. Um, a future hope, a future glory, um, peace for God's people, peace on earth, all of that. And we'll look in the next chapter and see how that peace is brought about. Um, so chapter 5, um, verse 2 and verse 5. Can somebody get verse 2 for me? Verse 2 and verse 5. Lydia. All right, go ahead um, with verse 2. But you, know Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Ephrathah, who are too low to be among the class of Judah, from you shall come forth uh, for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, who coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. All right. So when you hear the word Bethlehem, you know what that's talking about, right? What happened in Bethlehem? Jesus was born. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Yes. And so this is a direct, specific prophecy about where Christ would be born. And you could put the emphasis right there. 
But there's a much greater statement made about him in that verse. It said, whose comings, whose goings forth are from old. And I like the way the New King James puts this, that they are from everlasting. From everlasting. Let me ask you this. What being has no beginning and no end? God. Does anyone else have no beginning and no end? No. So he's saying this Messiah will be God. His goings forth are from everlasting. So that's a huge statement on who Christ, who the Messiah would be. That he would be God. He will be born, but he had no beginning. He's God. And then verse 5. Lydia. And he shall be their peace. When the Assyrians come to our land and tread in our places, then we will rise rise against them seven shepherds and eight princes of peace. He will be our peace. We could look up, uh, somebody get Romans, turn to Romans 5. If one per person could turn to Romans 5 for me. Um, Kaylin wants to turn to Romans 5. And read verse um, 1 and verse 10. We're going to see, um, th- there's a, a, this is a multi-layered thing. But we're just going to kind of hit on one thing mainly tonight. On how he is our peace. Uh, 5 1 and 5 10. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For if while we were enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. All right. So it said, we are enemies. And then it said, because of Christ, we have peace through His blood. So who were we enemies with before we were saved? Christ. God. We were enemies of God. And so Christ, that is in the New Testament, when it talks about Christ being our peace, that's the primary uh, thing that it talks about. And He even said here in Micah, He said, my my people have risen up as an enemy against me. And now he comes and says that this Messiah will be our peace. And there's a a lot more to that and a lot more to be said um, about that. That's all that that we're going to hit on tonight. Um, I'll say this. Um, There there will be different levels of of peace that he will bring um, as he sees fit on this earth. But the the ultimate, final, complete peace will be when we are all in, all all those in Christ are together and sin is done away with and there will be a complete peace because we will all be in Christ and He will have no more enemies. Um, So let's see. um, Chapter... Let's see... Let me check on something. All right, yeah. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Can somebody read that? Go for it. Hear what, you, hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indic- indictment of the Lord and the enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. You said through what? Uh, that, I think that's good right there, what you read. Yeah. The, the, he says, so he says this. Um, in verse 1, he says, plead your case. You know, at, in, the, in the first chapter, God says, I'm, I've, I've got a case against you. I'm going to bear witness against you. And now God is stepping down from the witness stand and he's calling Israel up and saying, okay, now you bear witness against me. And he says this, 
In what way have I wearied you? What cause did I ever give you to do what you have done? To, to disobey me over and over and over and to seek and worship and have affection for these false gods. What cause did I ever give you? And so he calls them to testify of that. And there's crickets and, and they can't say a thing because God never once gave them a cause to disobey him. All right, now we're going to come to probably the, the most famous verse in the book of Micah. Um, Micah 6 8. Does anybody know without looking what Micah 6 8 says? There used to be a song about it um, that we sang back uh, 20 something years ago in college and career. Um, that had just the, the verse and the song. I'm not going to sing it because it really, looking back, it was not that great. Um, a lot of those courses, I mean, the words were good, but a lot of those courses were just super lame um, 25 years ago. But this is what he says in Micah 6, 8, and I'll, I'll read it. He says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These people had not done justly. They had not loved mercy. They had not walked humbly. And that's what the Lord required of them. Um, here's an example, a good one, from the lesson last week. What was the lesson last week on? What book? Jonah. Jonah, that's right. Did Jonah love mercy? No. In fact, you remember, that was the thing about God that he disliked the most. He was like, God, I know you're a loving, merciful God, and you're going to spare these people, and you're not going to strike them down in your judgment and anger. And he was mad about it. He was sad about it. And these people were the same. They did not love mercy. There's also this. Um, you know, this, this verse has become, this verse has become like a mantra for a lot of um, wokeism, for a lot of virtue signaling, even within the church, or especially within the church, because it's a Bible verse. Um, and, but a man-centered view of this would be to say this, okay, well, that's what God wants. He wants me to to do justly, well, you know, I'm, I think I can, I can do that. I'm, I'm, a pretty, I'm, I'm pretty fair in my dealings. And I, I, went to a, I went to a social justice protest. And, you know, I, I think that was, you know, means that I'm very passionate about social justice. And, um, you know, I, I love mercy. Um, you know, I volunteered at a charity event one time. And I love mercy. And I took a selfie and I put it on Facebook to show how passionate I am about like loving mercy. And um, I'm being like Pastor Tim now, aren't I? And you're like, hey, why don't you just, why don't you you just stop? Wings. Do what? You gotta flap your wings. Oh. <laughs> and I'm a pretty humble guy. You know, I'm, I'm good. That's a man centered view. It doesn't see God for who he is, it doesn't elevate this to the level that God would have it. And we'll see in a minute um, what he actually does require of us in that way. All right, chapter 7. It's almost as if, if somebody could turn to chapter 7, verses 2 through 4. It's almost like Micah anticipated that line of thinking. Um, someone could read that. Uh, Lydia, go ahead. The godly has perished from the earth, and there was no one upright among mankind. They all lie and wait for blood, and each hunts another with a net. Their hands are on what is evil, and to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desires of the soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a barrier, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. 
The day of your watchmen, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. All right, so like I said, it's almost like if, if you read chapter 6 and you said, here's what the Lord requires of you. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And you think, I, I think I do that. <coughs> and then he turns right around and he says, no. The, absolute, the faithful have perished from among the children of men. The best of them is like a briar. A briar is useless for anything but causing pain. This is so much like Romans chapter 3 that talks about the total depravity and sinfulness and inability of man. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Paul says in Romans 3. They have all together become, become corrupt. There's none who seeks after God. There's none good. No, not even one. They have perished from the earth. And Michael was talking about himself too. Like I said, he was a contemporary of Isaiah. And he, at the start of this chapter, he even uses the same language that Isaiah says in chapter 6 of Isaiah and in chapter 7 here. He says, woe is me. And y'all remember what happened in Isaiah 6? Do y'all remember what happened to Isaiah? It's one of our favorite chapters here at this church. I think it's like all of our favorite chapters, I think. Um, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord on the ultimate high place in heaven, lifted up on his throne. And the cherubim surrounded him. And with two wings they flew, and with two wings they covered their face, and with two wings they covered their feet, and they circled the throne day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I dwell, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a piece, people of unclean lips. He didn't say, Oh God, yeah, huh. I'm glad you're finally shown up. You know, there's some sinners over here. No, he didn't say that. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And in that kind of, with that kind of language, the faithful have perished. What hope do we have? And our hope is in the Lord in, in chapter 7, um, verses 18 and 19. Um, if somebody could read that for me. Who wants to read chapter 7, 18, and 19? Just read it. You got to read it. Who is, a, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He has not retained his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of your sins into the depths of the sea. Who is a God like you? And I told you Micah did a play with his own name in this book. The name Micah, Micah, which is, means who like God. Who is like God. That's what his name means. And he says, who is a God like you? So he even uses his own name in Hebrew as a play on those words. So God, who is like him? Yes, he is holy, holy, holy. He's holy in his justice and in wrath against sin. He's set apart. There is no one. There is no one who is as angry and wrathful and hates sin as much as God. No one. He is set apart in His wrath. But there is also no one who is loving and kind and merciful like God. And so that's where our hope lies. And He says that He, in that verse, that He delights in mercy. He delights in it. So let me ask you this. If He's going to have mercy, if, if He's going to have mercy of, on us, what cause, 
was he given to have mercy? What cause did we ever give him to have mercy? Did we ever give him one? No. And you think about this in chapter 6, he calls them to the witness stand. He says, take the stand. What cause have I ever given you to rebel against me? What cause? And the answer is, never once did he give them a cause to rebel against him. And now we flip it around and say, what cause have we ever given him to have mercy on us? And the answer is, he loved us and showed us mercy even though we never once gave him a cause to do so. God is holy in his mercy and in his love. And it was at a great cost to himself to show that mercy. What did it cost him to show us that mercy? Some may read this passage where it said, he will trample our sins underfoot and he will cast our sins in, uh, into, the, into the depths of the sea. And they may just read that and say, well, I guess God just decided to just do that. You know, he... He just decided, I'm just going to pardon them. I'm just going to forgive them. But remember, this whole book, what has this whole book been like a courtroom setting? He even talked in Micah about how the judges were being unjust and were taking bribes and were pardoning people that were guilty. And now he comes here and says, I'm going to pardon people that are guilty. You see the problem? God cannot forgive sin by sweeping it under the rug. He cannot do it. He will not do it. So, what does this mean then? He will tread our sins underfoot. He will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. How does casting our sins into the sea satisfy His wrath and His justice? I want you all to think about this with me. He cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Who, we studied Jonah last week, right? What happened to Jonah? Was he, in, was he thrown into the sea? Can anybody put that together? What, was the sea raging? And they threw him into the sea and what happened? It stopped. Let me give you a verse that will help you in this. In Corinthians, it says this, He made Him, that is, the Father made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He took our sins on Himself. So if this says he cast our sins into the depths of the sea, who is being cast into the depths of the sea? Jesus. Jesus. He bore our sins. Our sins were laid on him. And he was cast into the sea of God's wrath. He will tread our sins underfoot. What does that mean? Our sins are being tread underfoot. What exactly is being tread underfoot? Who is being tread underfoot? Who is being tread underfoot? Does anyone know? I can't hear anybody say an answer. Huh? Jesus. Jesus. It's not an inanimate object. It's not the sin. It's a person. He is treading him underfoot. Listen, I want you to see this. In Isaiah, it said it was... And and here's the thing I want you to see too. Who is doing the treading and who is doing the casting into the sea? Who is that talking about? It says God, right? God who? Which God? The Father. The Father. The Father, it says in Isaiah, it was the will of the Lord, of Yahweh, of the Father, to crush Him. And that's what we see here. 
Our sins are being tread underfoot. Do you see this? Our sins are placed on Christ. And Yahweh, the Father, crushed Him. This is how God can maintain His justice and still have mercy for sinners. We have pictures of this, incredible pictures of this in the Old Testament, like Abraham and Isaac. You all know the story of Abraham and Isaac where he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son that you love, and I want you to take him up on the hill, and I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to kill him. And Abraham, and, and you, you, you look at this story, and it mainly focuses on Abraham, who is the father. And he takes his son up this hill, and he draws out the knife, and he's got the knife back. You all know the story. And God stops him. And there, and God says, no, I've, I've provided a lamb. I will spare your son. I've provided my own lamb. And they took that lamb, and they sacrificed the lamb, and they went on. When you become a parent, um, you start to feel some of the weight of that story. Like, you would do anything to protect your kids. Anything. And yet, the love that I have for my kids is minuscule compared to the love that the Eternal Father has for His perfect, infinitely worthy, only begotten Son. And hundreds of years after Abraham's son was spared, the Son of God went up on a hill. And the Father took the knife. God the Father took the knife and He plunged it into the heart of His only begotten Son. So with that in mind, let's go back to Micah 6.8. So do you want to know what God means when He says to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly? We have to look to Jesus. We have to look to the Gospel to that. To do justly? How much does God value justice? How much does God love justice? The cross shows us. He loves justice so much that He will not spare His Son in order to maintain justice. Do you consider justice to that level? Is justice that serious of a thing for you? And then to love mercy? Do you love mercy like God loves mercy? God loves mercy so much that He did not spare His own Son in order to show mercy on people who had never once given Him the cause to do so. How about walking humbly with your God? Paul said this, again, look to Jesus over and over in the New Testament. That's the language. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Or like Paul says in Philippians in this passage, you want to know how to walk humbly with your God? Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself. And being found in the likeness of men, he, he took on the form of a slave. And he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So I want to close with this, this one thought. Micah 6.8 says, I have shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And in light of what we just said, can you do what the Lord requires of you? Can you love justice so much that you will slaughter your own son to satisfy that justice? Do you love mercy so much that you will not spare your own son 
in order to show mercy to a people? And do you, do you walk, do you have such humility that you would empty yourself and take on the form of a slave? No. So the ultimate answer to that is we cannot do what the Lord requires of us. And so what we need is the Savior that this book testifies of. Because if we can't keep the demands of the law, then we are still His enemies. And unless we have been, the demands have been kept for us in Christ, we will never have peace with Him. And so that is how Jesus can be our peace. How this book points to Christ as our peace. As the true and greater Micah, the true and greater prophet. Let's pray. Father, I come to You and I just thank You so much, Lord, for Your indescribable gift of Your Son. Lord, there have been thousands of songs written and thousands of songs sung about the wondrous mystery that is the Gospel. And throughout endless ages, Lord, we will glory in Your grace that You've shown us in Christ. Lord, I just pray if there are any here that have never had their eyes opened to Jesus, have never had their eyes opened to the holiness of God, have never had their eyes opened to their great need of a Savior, that You would do that, Lord. That You would teach our hearts to fear Lord, I pray that we would because You have taken out those of us that are saved. You've taken out our hearts of stone and given us a heart of flesh. I pray that we would do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. That we would love mercy so much that we would lay down our lives in sharing the Gospel with people. Because the Gospel is the only hope for them to have mercy shown on them. Lord, we praise You and we thank You for all that You've done. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.